welcome to Conversations, Lehman College's series of discussions with major theater and musical figures of our time. Our guest today for the second of a two-part chat is composer and lyricist Adam Gettle. Welcome back, Adam. Thanks. Thank you for having me. I, I wanted to uh, uh, delve a little into some of your lyrics, and, and uh, I was fascinated with them, the lyrics especially. Not that I, I, I didn't love the music, I know. but the lyrics got to me in a, as, as a fellow lyricist. Uh, the, uh, the writing, uh, to write a, 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 an aria, an aria a song, uh, in Italian, and, and uh, how did that happen? You, you wrote, uh, there's a lot of Italian. Yeah. Lots and lots of Italian in this. Well, one of the challenges of the Light in the Piazza was to deal with the fact that these were two Americans in Italy, and the convention is, or had been, uh, to simply have um, people who would ordinarily be speaking uh, another language speak our language with that other language's accent, which sort What's of, the matter? It <laughs> seemed cheesy, and, and uh, I mean, that's not the only convention, but it's certainly one that comes to mind, and, and it, it, it seemed that the best way to deal with this dramatic uh, challenge was to face it and, an actu and actually uh, go into it rather than away from it. Uh, and, um, and so uh, that also suited the the basic language of the show, which is uh, is love or music, um, and or music as a stand-in for what people feel for each other, that ineffable thing which can't really be articulated in words anyway. Um, and the third reason to go into uh, Italian rather than away from it uh, was that that is the position that Margaret and Clara are in. Um, and why not put the audience in the same place uh, uh, as, as Margaret and Clara as they, as they land in Italy and, and experience it f uh, afresh? Uh, and so it was necessary to make sure that, for instance, in Il Mondo Era Voto, that we know exactly what would be on Fabrizio's mind at that time in the show. Um, the world is empty. Yeah. And that before I met this girl, there was nothing. I didn't even know there was nothing until I met her. And now there's everything. How could have I, I have even lived before? Um, but that we don't, as the audience, speak Italian, but that we know that um, he is in this mode. It is full-on musical theater, sort of love at first sight. Uh, and uh, there's a section of the song where he says, and wh why would she, Papa, you have to help me be a man and be, uh, be attractive to her and, and be a winner. Look at me, I'm a loser. And, and uh, that's sort of the, the kind of, the B section of, of his, his uh, first experience of her, which is, please let this happen. But you're doing this in Italian, and the audience understands everything. Well, the circumstance is fairly clear, and, and I had to make sure the lyric was also, gave the audience as many clues as it could uh, have. Now, you worked with Judy Blazer on Yeah, the yeah. I wrote a lyric, um, and I knew what each line needed to be about. Uh, and I went to Judy Blazer, who's an awesomely talented uh, actress, singer, thinker, teacher. And uh, we had the best time. We worked sort of concentrically. Because as a, a sort of Italian neophyte, I was especially uh, a concerned that the sound of the word to the American ear um, communicated the meaning of the word, uh, as well as the word itself. So the word had to be accurate. It had to be singable. The vowel had to be good. Uh, and it also had to elicit sort of a feel, just like color can make you feel something. A vowel sound can make you feel something. And we had a wonderful time sort of concentrically arriving at what those lines needed to be. And it, if, and it influenced the meaning of the song as well. So what I came in with was just a beginning. And we ended up completely doing it together. I'm so sympathetic to doing that. I, I did that in Ghost of Versailles, writing in uh, Turkish and Arabic, a language of totally unfamiliar with. And uh, wow. uh, we had so much fun doing that, John yeah. and I. It's very freeing. 
Yeah. Ingl I mean, one's own language can feel pretty finite, especially when you're dealing with a, a phrase like I love you or, you know, it's hard, hard to make that one feel uh, I thought I, I should read, uh, I suppose my, my favorite uh, lyric is Come With Me. Um, Passeggiata? Uh, Passeggiata. Uh -huh. I, can I just read a little? Sure. I just, uh, uh, this is really corny of me, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, come with me, walk with me, walking in my city, una passeggiata, you and I, see the faces from the daytime, talking in the evening, see the churches shining, see the sky. Now is I am happiness, never I am unhappiness, now is I am happiness with you. Walk with me in the place that I know, La Passageta. Now that's just gorgeous. And yeah. it's uh, uh, so, it's a man who doesn't speak English well. And uh, that's utterly realistic in a way and, and terribly impressionistic at the same time. It isn't quite the way someone would speak, but it, it's so suggestive of it that it, it works on a realistic and a romantic level at the same time. I find that sort of thing very freeing. With Floyd Collins, it was a very specific vernacular um, right. uh, from Barron County, Kentucky in 1925, um, that time and place. And to work through a lens and a set of words or a set of a whole sensibility, a language is a sensibility, is a way of seeing life. And uh, um, to, to work through a character who doesn't speak English um, I, I found uh, very freeing. Also, in this, in this day and age of the uh, unquestionable brilliance of a guy like uh, Steve Sondheim, sorry, I have an eyelash, uh, um, I don't have any desire to run myself through the sawmill of inferiority as far as <laughs> fabulous, <Cleverness>. lyric, <laughs> perfect, <laughs> clever, great in every way. I just, I have to find some other way of writing lyrics. Now you have been <laughs> compared to Steve Hunt Sondheim, which I don't get at all. I really don't get it, either musically or lyrically. Um, it doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, as, as, as much as I hold him in the highest regard, I, I don't uh, see myself, uh, see, see his work in, in me, other than that I aspire to his level. I mean, I try to reach it, but I, I, uh, I don't either. I think that you're dealing with, most of the time, you're dealing with people for whom, if they hear a stacked fifth, they think it sounds like Copeland. If they hear anything, they hear two notes next to each other, it's got to be uh, dissonant. You know, I mean, you're, it's... You that, really don't sound like him. You know, so, th so there, you know, if you're, if you're writing something that isn't um, uh, some confection for teenage girls, uh, you know, you're suddenly tr trying to be Stephen Sondheim and... There's yeah. only one place, there are only two positions to be in rock and roll and Steve Sondheim, but there are a million positions. Right, right, positions. of course. There of are course. So, positions. So again, you know, if I, if I thought there was um, actual substance to it, uh, I, I think I'd be a lot worse off. I don't think uh, it would be a great strategy to um, try to imitate uh, Steve's work. There are plenty of those. <laughs> <laughs> the joy you feel uh, that glorious uh, song. I feel like there, I feel like there are, uh, you're somewhere in between opera and musical theater uh -huh. and, 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 and Broadway. It's just, so I, uh, I tend to think of them as arias. Uh -huh. um, well, what's the difference? Who cares? Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a word. Uh, it's just a word. That, Th that piece is, uh, was not in the book. That's a, situ the joy you feel is a situation in which, uh, Fabrizio's sister-in-law, Fabrizio, the Italian lover's uh, brother's wife, um, sees herself in Clara when Clara comes um, to the apartment for the first time and means to be nice to her, wants to be nice to her, says, let me show you the paintings. Um, and out of her, um, involuntarily, com comes sort of a, a warning and a, a sort of jugular slash in which she... Uh, says, uh, it's all so wonderful, isn't it? And wait till you're 
in the middle of a piazza, let's say it'll be your first anniversary, and, uh, and your husband, his glance will rest across the piazza, and eventually you'll you want to know what he's looking at, and there will be a woman who's younger and prettier than you are. Uh. Oh, it's a Colette story. <laughs> it really is. There's so much. Uh, are you aware of how much Colette, the feeling of Colette is in this musical? No, but that's a, no, I'll take that. Colette, I'll take. Oh, you really, it's, it's so, it's so that's Colette. Not. Older woman, younger man, mm. and uh, romance and perfume and the, and the mm. works. And, uh, well, I mean, uh, that, that speaks to the thing about the show, which is everybody is very much uh, activated by this central romance. Right. We're all made to see our loss, our disappointment, our aspiration. Now, you've gone into a new realm. Um, uh, what makes this uh, so unusual to me um, is when you get to Ayutami, help me, there it's just an amazingly naked scream for help. It's just naked. And uh, that I have never heard in a, in a musical. That song it has been the subject of some um, controversy because uh, before Il Mondo della Volta was written for the first act, and that song again is all in Italian, Ayutami was the only song that was all in Italian, um, as far as my, uh, as, as far as I recollect, I think, and and so and in the middle of that song, uh, the Italian mother who has not well has only spoken Italian throughout the entire first act turns to the audience and in perfect English with no idiomatic, you know, over gerundizing or anything, just simply says, I don't speak English, but I have to tell you what's going on, um, <laughs> which uh, felt right and didn't feel like a big cop out um, before we had the, the all Italian song in the first act. But once that song was written, sort of and Ayutami had been working so well as a way to bring us back into the second act. Um, I feel that it is a bit of a flaw. In fact, um, I've often wondered if there was a way not to have her do that. But at any rate, yes, that song is mostly in Italian until we uh, kind of pull a fast one. It doesn't <laughs> strike me at all like a cop-out or anything. It seems like very logical that these characters would end up screaming, help me. And right. haven't we all been there? Yeah. And, uh, uh, and I think the audiences must respond to that. Uh, and, the audience uh, I saw uh, was with, it tends they, to they responded to it. So I think you're fine there. And uh, um, uh, I re really, on this show, we've never discussed the piece so in depth. And I'm glad, oh, good. I'm glad we've done it. This is a first for us. And <laughs> I want to do more of it. It just. Uh, it's such a powerful piece. It's being done all over the place, I would imagine. Um, I, I like your imagination very much. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, it's being done in Japan right now. Japan? Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, I just saw the poster. Uh, it's kind of mind-blowing to, to see that. Um, and it's going to be done in Sweden. Uh, we're still looking for a happy home in, in England. Um, uh, the National would be lovely. It's a thrust, as it was mm -hmm. in Lincoln Center, but I'm not sure that they're interested. In fact, I'm somewhat sure that they're not. And uh, so, yeah, and it's being done, it's being released into the world here in the States, and um, it may even be done in Vermont this coming summer. So, <laughs> Floyd Collins, I understand, is an extremely popular property. And uh, uh, why do you suppose that Floyd Collins is, uh, uh, which is uh, a difficult piece, has yeah. done so much? Well, I hope it's done because, and if I were to die today, I would hope that I had told stories, uh, even ahead of writing good music or lyrics, that I had um, created a world in which people wanted to live for two hours that felt a pretty unalloyed, that it felt like an indelible experience of that very specific time and place and set of characters and What struck me then about Floyd Collins is that you... Um, you captured, you and Tina captured the hucksterism of, of America, the, uh, the hucksterism of the religion, mm. of politics, in an amazingly, uh, amazing way, somewhat prescient, uh, actually, mm. of the present. And uh, how uh, a man 
uh, underground would turn into a national mm -hmm. obsession. And you captured each level of that. Well, it was a, it was a good combination uh, to, to be working with Tina because we had actually equally strong and uh, quite different um, interests and um, impulses about the material, uh, which we kind of slammed together to create the show. Um, I was, at first, almost exclusively interested in Floyd's experience of being underground and his family's relationship to him. Uh, um, and she was, not exclusively, but, but very interested in the hucksterism angle. Mm -hmm. um, and I think by, by um, sort of both of us st sticking by our guns, we uh, were able to uh, sort of modify both sides. For instance, um, it was important to me that, that journalists not be treated like just venal, uh, muckraking idiots, uh, because it is in all of us to trump up a story, to, to add things and subtract things. Uh, basically, though we may not admit it, to um, lift ourselves up, um, and that's kind of what happened with Floyd. The, the, it spirals completely out of yeah. control. And, uh, and so we, we, uh, we created situations in which the locals and the, uh, s the kind of sympathetic characters are also doing the same thing. Well, we see this in, uh, uh, from, well, practically every day, uh, these news stories, poor, the poor baby is dying, and, right. uh, uh, yeah. you know, it's upstaging it's Iraq, it's upstaging <laughs> everything. Yeah. Uh, tsunamis get mm -hmm. put in because some, some person is stuck somewhere. Yeah. Well, the ability to, to focus on an individual in a circumstance like that is really, I think, what allows people to insert themselves into it. Uh, as a composer lyricist, which comes first, uh, uh, the m words or the music? Music, always. Um, I, 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 music is an infinite language, and I want to be as specific with the material I'm working on as I can be. And so I do music first because, to me, that's... N much more specific uh, emotionally. The, the, the ambience of a score, the, the actual lexicon or the syntax of a score is very precise, whereas I do the words later, having written myself into a corner, I'll have to be precise with the words. <laughs> uh, now, having been in the position of, of getting tunes from various composers and then having to fit words to it, mm. this is fiendishly difficult. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> Yeah, it's rats running inside of your head. Do you uh, often have to? Uh, do you often have to alter the music to suit the words? Then I think Is there the some one of the reasons that my my lyrics are sometimes uh, a little bit rough edged is that I do that as little as I can because uh -huh. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to dumb down the musical language in service of a language which, um, at least in my hands is a finite. Um, right. I want the specificity of the music language to serve the storytelling first and foremost, and then I, I, I just try to accommodate it. So sometimes my lyrics kind of just fall off the edge of the table a little bit. But you can't have everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've written art songs for Audrey McDonald. Uh, uh, have you uh, written for anyone else? Yeah. Uh, this is terribly awkward because I'm, I'm a bit hazy this morning. I'm not going to forget a lot of people. I mean, I feel that I've written um, some of my shows with certain people very much in mind. Teresa McCarthy is a great right. muse of mine, a wonderful singer-actress who I wrote the part of Nellie for, I mean, very much on. Um, and uh, Kelly O'Hara is somebody who um, um, is, 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 is wonderful in, in The Light in the Piazza. And, and towards the end of the process, who I was sort of hanging the, the show on her, right. um, and as the show progressed, I wrote a lot of it for Vicky. A um, number of things which were cut, um, uh, which were more of a spresh stimma kind of a thing, a whole other language that I have that I've never really gotten to do you anything with. You and stimma, I would love to hear that sometime. <laughs> well, you will, I hope. I mean, that's sort of the next direction I'm hmm. going in. Not, not technically spresh stimma, but simply a more fluid uh, uh, use of music and, and storytelling than song, scene. Do you attend the works of others? Uh, when I'm uh, when my ego feels robust, I, I do. That's what I. 
<laughs> My next question, do you find it stimulating or intimidating? <laughs> um, I, I find it thrilling and absolutely devastating when a piece is good. Um, mm -hmm. and, and when a piece is not, um, I find it depressing, and saddening, and also thrilling. <laughs> the, 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 I find the theater thrilling in that way. <laughs> now, uh, you, uh, uh, you write mainly for theater, I gather, uh, but uh, do you long to write a symphony as well? Or? Absolutely not. I, no. I do not uh, really imagine in the abstract. I, I only imagine through character uh, and circumstance and desire. Um, that's the only way I can bring myself into the process and really the only way I can generate any work. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, music for its own sake, I not Abstract music is, that. no. Uh, what inspires you? Uh, I would have to say a uh, depth of understanding of a character. I, the, the, the more I feel that I have of myself through a character is probably what generates, what gives me energy to work. And that's probably the same thing as inspiration. Um, you know, wonderful, spectacular uh, sort of mise-en-scene for, for this story or that. It's inspiring in a kind of surfacey way. But those bells don't really keep ringing. What, what, what gives me energy is, is to feel that I have some sympathy for um, someone. A character. Yeah. What is your working day like now? Uh, I write in the morning. And uh, when I say write, uh, I think the real writing time is when I begin to structure a number and uh, write the lyric. Um, before that, it's uh, just expressing my sense of a character and a situation through a, a kind of set of musical words. And as uh, these... What do you mean, musical words? Well, a harmony can feel like a word, or ah. a phrase, a, a melodic phrase. And, um, and words don't make sentences for quite a while. As you begin to assemble a score, or even just a song, you have an impulse. You know this character might feel like this, or like that. And then that's just one phrase, or one word, or one clause. Eventually, the syntax begins to assemble, and you begin to make sentences, and then even paragraphs. And I, I mean, I, I really do work that way. I, um, and I, I also work very uh, inch by inch. I'm not a sort of do the whole big swath and then fill it in and make it better. I, I, you know, I throw 40 million of these out, and then once I've got that one, I throw 40 million of those. And so this is a painstaking process. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very slow. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, terribly embarrassed by it all the time. I don't know if I'll ever get over that. I wish I were faster. My main fantasy, practically sexual fantasy, is to be a faster writer. <laughs> I so, so do I want to. I be. so identify <laughs> with you. I'm the slowest person in the world. Yeah. <laughs> it's terrible. Yeah. I'm slower than you. <laughs> you don't know how slow, we'll have a slow, slow, slow is. Ask Ricky Gordon. <laughs> uh, what are you working on now? I'm not uh, writing anything right now. I'm reading and just improvising um, and, and just staying up on my instruments. I'm trying to bring my voice back. Um, but I'm. What do you mean trying to bring your voice well, back? Well, I smoked for a number of years, and I haven't for about two and a half years. So. Um, oh, you're working on singing? Yeah, because I write very much through my voice. Mm -hmm. um, and I uh, often write in a very. Uh, I often write at a very high register for both men and women. Uh, because uh, that's where, until, You're Mar always until I met Marlboro, that's where, <laughs> that's where I, my, I was placed. And now I, I don't know, it's all going to be about Jerome Hines. And, and, uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but uh, I, I just, I improvise uh, and play music all, uh, during the day, and I sing, and, and I read, uh, looking for the next story. I will say that um, I'm particularly interested, having worked on Princess Bride for two years, um, which was a very pop, very propulsive um, uh, uh, kind of vocabulary. Not formally pop, not AABA, two and a half minutes, 
uh, and lots of repeated choruses with modulations especially, but, uh, but in terms of the instrumentation and the rhythmic underpinnings, it was a very sort of forthright um, rhythmic score and, uh, and very much a fairy tale adventure. Um, so that's sort of over here now, and having done that for two years, um, I'm interested in uh, a more fluid operatic language. Um, and I have a, a commission to come up with something for uh, a project that Peter Gelb has initiated uh, with Met. Lincoln Center at the Met and, and Lincoln Center. And, if I, and so I, I'm sort of looking and working on um, uh, some small stories that I'm going to tell in that new language, which is a uh, more... I suppose, for want of a better word, operatic language. Well, who are your favorite opera composers? Uh, Britain, um, uh, Debussy, uh, Puccini. Um, Those are fluid composers. Uh, yes, sure. I, I, absolutely. Um, Rake's progress is, is, is very, very inventive. Um, and particularly for me right now, um, I think that's an important score. Um, um, Corleano goes to Versailles. I think that there are uh, um, some some people writing now who are quite wonderful too. Um, Ricky Gordon is an, an incredible composer. Um, Sam Barber is someone I've always admired very much. Uh, and uh, De Todestad is an incredible piece, uh, Korngold, um, which he wrote revoltingly when he was like 20 or something. <laughs> God bless him. For, yeah, there's, <laughs> there are a lot of them. But I think that... Uh, Britain is particularly interesting because of his understanding of theatrical ambience, that right. he really knew how to put a little pentagram in your pocket and just right. creep and brilliant. They're, <laughs> they're waving at me frantically that oh, we have to stop. stop. And uh, I'm sorry to say we have to stop. This <laughs> has gone by very quickly, hasn't it? Oh, I enjoyed uh, it. Uh, uh, it has been a great pleasure once oh. again to speak oh. with you. And uh, uh, thank you, Adam Gettle and our home and studio audiences for joining us today for conversations and we hope to see you again soon thank you thank you Adam. <laughs>